We're going to continue today with Rodgers and Hammerstein and really focusing again on the King and I and taking it forward from there. Um, <clears throat> the King and I really was so... <laughs> It was a monumental clash of cultures. In one corner, there was Rodgers and Hammerstein, the most American and the most heartfelt of Broadway songwriters. In the other, you had Gertrude Lawrence, a British spitfire, the most sophisticated and glamorous of musical stage performers. Despite the gulf between them, Rodgers and Hammerstein would collaborate with Lawrence on a show that would be remembered as a career landmark for all three. A musical clash of cultures that still resonates today. The King and I. As the 1950s began, Lawrence was interested in appearing in a big old Broadway smash. She brought a novel to the team entitled Anna and the King of Siam, based on the real-life chronicles of a Welsh schoolmistress named Anna Leonowens, as she taught the children of the Siamese king Mankut at the height of the Victorian era. Getting to know you, getting to know all about you. Having acquired a star as their eye, the team approached Hollywood and theater royalty for their king, Rex Harrison, Noel Coward, and Alfred Drake. They all turned down the role. In near despair, Rodgers and Hammerstein auditioned a television director born in Vladivostok, Yul Brynner. He had a guitar, said Rodgers, and he hit his guitar one whack and gave out with this unearthly yell and sang some heathenish sort of thing. Oscar and I looked at each other and said, well, that's it. Oh, oh, sometimes I think that people going mad. Ah, sometimes I think that people not so bad. The Siamese setting no was the most exotic that Rodgers and Hammerstein had ever encountered. But they took up the challenge with an inventive score and a book that built its texture out of centuries of Siamese court rituals. They were aided immeasurably by the dramatic choreography of the young Jerome Robbins, the first and only time he would work with Rodgers and Hammerstein. Typically, the romance in a musical would be between its leading characters. But the real passion in The King and I is for tolerance and progress. Still, amidst all their cultural sparring, the show simmers with an unspoken romantic tension between Anna and the King. This unique perspective, the exotic setting, the stunning design, and the chemistry between its leads catapulted the King and I immediately into hit status. Opening on March 29, 1951, it ran for more than three years and won five Tony Awards, including Best Musical. Gertrude Lawrence won for Best Actress in a Musical, while Brenner won for Best Featured Actor. His name was below the title. Brinner would ascend the billing throne when The King and I was made into a Cinemascope blockbuster in 1956. With most of the material intact, Brinner reprised his role, now opposite Deborah Carr, and won an Oscar for his performance as Best Actor. The King had reclaimed his crown. Over the next three decades, Brinner would take on the mantle of the king for over 4,600 performances in various revivals, becoming nearly synonymous with the role. Still, the show has whistled its own happy tune through numerous other productions around the world and on Broadway. A revival in 1996 featured an all-Asian cast playing the Siamese court for the first time. The most recent revival at Lincoln Center Theater in 2015 also cast the court with all Asian American actors and treated the show's Siamese context with dignity and respect. Kelly O'Hara, one of the most acclaimed Broadway actresses of her generation, won her first Tony Award as Mrs. Anna. From west to east, The King and I still retains its power to captivate audiences, get them to reflect on their own values, and move them to tears as well. And
etc., etc., etc. Very well, Your Majesty. The King and I, using they talk about how uh, Alfred Drake turned down the role. That's really not the case. Alfred Drake was offered the role, and his demands were so outrageous that Rodgers and Hammerstein turned him down. Uh, again, you know, we talked about some of this last week, but let's move on to things you didn't see. And this is that revival with Kelly O'Hara when that ship came out and emerged. Like, in, it was amazing the way Bangkok was portrayed so realistically and true uh, to the mid 1860s in this Lincoln Center production. My head erect and whistle a happy tune so no one will suspect I while shivering in my shoes, I strike a careless pose and whistle a happy tune, and no one ever knows I'm afraid. The result of this deception is very strange to tell, for when I fool the people I fear, I fool myself as well. I whistle a happy tune, and every single time, the happiness in the tune Again, the King and I from the Lincoln Center production. And, you know, you notice that they talk about uh, using an all Asian cast. Far too often, Not they just put anybody ever. in that they and could. Uh, and they didn't really cast Asian actors, which is something that Actors' Equity changed in the mid 1990s, that actors had to be true in terms of race to their character whenever possible. We nominated for nine Tony Awards. The King and I follows the story of Anna, an English woman in the 1860s who has traveled to Siam to teach the many children of the king. Here's Tony nominee Kelly O'Hara as Anna, who is getting better acquainted with her new pupils. It's a very ancient saying, but a true and honest thought, that if you become a teacher, by your pupils, you'll be taught. As a teacher, I've been learning. You'll forgive me if I boast. And I've now become an expert on the subject I like most. Getting to know you. Getting to know you. Getting to know you. Getting to know you, getting to feel 
Now, you know, there were many songs that were written for the characters, and one of the problems was the love songs, because they obviously were not going to be love songs between the king and Mrs. Anna, but they had to have other people. So the gift of the slave girl that was sent from the king of uh, uh, Burma to the, um, to the king of Siam, uh, that became a source of great love songs. great love songs uh, that the king and I really provided. Now, the song of puzzlement was sort of a singspiel. That's the style that Rex Harrison turned down the king and I because he said he would never lower himself to singing. But it was then written as a singspiel, uh, which is how they enticed uh, Rex Harrison later to do My Fair Lady, showing them what Rodgers and Hammerstein did for the King and I. There were some nights, Yul Brenner, who was so afraid of singing on the stage uh, that he actually almost didn't do this. Uh, but he really did uh, accomplish it quite well. Now, Hello, Young Lover is another magnificent song, again, sung by Mrs. Anna, talking about her recollection uh, of love songs as well.
noticed this was Kelly O'Hara from the Lincoln Center version filmed live. I'm not quite sure how they did it live in the Vivian Beaumont uh, because the ushers are emphatic. So this must have been something that was filmed as part of an understudy uh, training film of some sort or other. Another interesting clip from The King and I was the small house of Uncle Thomas, uh, the ballet that Jerome Robbins choreographed. Your Majesty. Let me just back up on this for one moment. Uh, this ballet, as created by Jerome Robbins, was his um, fury at being called before the House on American Activities Committee and the fact that he felt that governments interfere with the lives of people who don't matter. House is in Kingdom of Kentucky by the most wicked king in all America, Simon of Legree. Your Majesty, I beg to put before you loving friends. Uncle Thomas. Dear Uncle Thomas. Little Eva. Blessed little Eva. Little Topsy. Mr. Mega Topsy.
dogs sniff and smell and thereby discover all who run from key.
pretty city in Canada, where he lies in his lovely small house. Guess who lived in the house? Uncle Thomas. Dear Uncle Thomas! Little Eva. Blessed little Eva! Little Topsy. Get your finger, Topsy! Love a George. This choreography that Jerome Robbins created based upon uh, Siamese dance uh, was really so exquisite. And again, the ballet music that Richard Rogers wrote, we forget uh, that he did those. Well, here's another take on a popular song from the King My friends Matt Doyle and Jelani Aladdin take on this classic from the 1951 musical, adding a twist to bring it into the new era. Secret to 
It's incredible when you write a song that has power and meaning that, you know, again, without changing a lyric or doing anything, it can be in uh, a new era. Go on with the show. Go on with the well, Me and Juliet was the next musical uh, that Rodgers and Hammerstein wrote. Richard Rodgers didn't really, uh, he wanted to one-up Cole Porter. He wanted to show what he could do writing a musical about show business and a musical within a musical one-upping, he thought, Cole Porter. The reality was it never really did well. It, it, Richard Rogers only, uh, Oscar Hammerstein rather agreed because he felt Richard Rogers had agreed to do Allegro and that didn't go well. So he thought he owed it to Richard Rogers. Uh, it just never played well. It was sort of a mediocre uh, story, a backstage romance with a play within a play. And here's a picture of the cast. No one's happy in this picture except Richard Rogers, second from the left in the back. However, there's one song that really did uh, gain some traction, and Richard Rogers liked it so much he used it in Victory at Sea. No other love have I, only my love for you, only the dream we knew, no other love. Watching the night go by, wishing that you could be, watching the night with me, into the night I cry, hurry home, come home to me, set me free, free from doubt. From longing into your arms I'll fly, locked in your arms I'll stay, waiting to hear you say, no other love have I, no other love. Well, the next musical that they came up with uh, was based upon a Steinbeck novel called Sweet Thursday. Uh, Sweet Thursday was about a madam and the women who worked in her house, which really wasn't going to work, uh, you know, for a Rodgers and Hammerstein musical. So they made her into a woman who takes care of wayward girls. Set in Monterey, California, the musical tells the story about a romance and a biologist and Susie, who's a prostitute in the... Um, uh, in the play, in the book, it's only kind of alluded to. This was a flop and a financial disaster, a rarely seen uh, Rodgers and Hammerstein musical that was revived by City Center Encores a number of years ago. Rodgers and Hammerstein's rarely seen musical Pipe Dream is getting the star treatment with a new Encores concert staging. We're here at New York City Center to talk to Will Chase, Laura Osnes, Leslie Uggams, and more about this classic love story. How would you describe this brand new Rodgers and Hammerstein for audiences who may not be familiar? Um, it's a charmer. <laughs> it's a very obscure piece of theater. It is based on uh, the characters from John Steinbeck's novels Cannery Row and Sweet Thursday. Um, it is. It takes place in uh, sort of the, the flop house uh, area of California in, in 1955, mid-50s. It's just kind of about these two people who uh, want to find a place and a home in society and um, ending up having that in common and falling for each other. It's terrific. It's uh, 
you know, there's a pastiche of, of everything that they've done over the years. Um, I mean, it's obviously, it's Rodgers and Hammerstein, so you got a lot of great melodies and, and great chorus numbers. Um, I get to lead some of them, so it's, it's a blast. We rattle along, rattle along, rattle along on our way. On a one-sided ramshackle bus, we ride from day to day. The fun thing about doing this show, for people who don't know it, which, is most, which are most people, is that once you hear the opening of the overture and you hear these songs, it's undeniably and unmistakably Rodgers and Hammerstein. You know, it just sounds like Rodgers and Hammerstein. You, those two writers, how can you go wrong? You really can't go wrong. And two of the songs were very popular when I was a teenager. Um, All at Once You Love Her and uh, Everybody's Got a Home But Me. I look up and I cry to a cloud go. The score is filled with these unheard Rodgers and Hammerstein gems. Some of the music is absolutely gorgeous. It's fun, definitely fun to sing. It's this great combination of, 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 of people from all generations of Broadway, and everybody is so fun and good-natured, which is great, because this is a very good-natured show. You've played Bad Girl Sandy, you've played Killer Bonnie, but how does it feel to be playing Lady of the Night? Let's see. Well, Susie has this little kind of feisty side to her as well, so I'm able to kind of draw from that. But um, Susie's great. She's Nobody knows the show or this character, so it's fun to kind of be essentially recreating it for the first time since the 1950s. No one, you know, it's never been touched since. So uh, she's fun. I like her a lot. Why should audiences take a chance on Pipe Jam? I think because, one, you're not going to see this piece again. Uh, one, I know you've not seen this piece. High schools aren't doing this one. And Encores does this wonderful thing where they, they we, we don't bring our contemporary sensibility in the room. We celebrate the piece as is. We do, uh, other than a few little script changes, we're not really changing the intention of the composer and the lyricist and the book writer. And we kind of celebrate this piece uh, kind of like what it would have been like back in the day. I think every scene is going to bring a surprise for even the most diehard Rodgers and Hammerstein fans are going to be like, what? what? Wow, where did that come from? I think it's so rare to see a piece like this. Nobody's ever seen it, so come. I Hopefully, you know, curiosity is the one thing that will get people here, and we have an all-star cast. It's uh, the most amazing team, I think, that could ever be fit in these roles, and um, it's a really, it's a fun show, and it deserves a second life, so I'm glad that Encores is doing it. Well, it's never been seen since. Well, CBS wanted to rival uh, the production of Peter Pan that NBC had been showing, and they figured, how could we do that? We'll hire Rodgers and Hammerstein to write an original musical, something that had never been done for television before, and we'll base it on Cinderella. It was a huge production. Julie Andrews was still doing My Fair Lady in the evenings and rehearsing Cinderella during the day. And it had to be using Broadway actors who were used to performing live. It usurped uh, an Ed Sullivan and a Jack Benny on a Sunday night. And I remember as a little kid actually watching this and then my father bringing me home that album the next day. So it was uh, done in color. CBS borrowed the NBC cameras uh, and there were no color videos that could be made. So there is a kinesthetic scope that exists. Uh, it has a real delightful charm, but of course it was refilmed with Leslie Ann Warren and then once again with Brandy. But if you can get that Cinderella with Julie Andrews, uh, it really is pretty incredible. It was filmed in two warehouses in Long Island City that were studios uh, and they had to use the two warehouses because of the size of the sets and the 30-piece orchestra that they used. And of course, it utilized all Broadway actresses, Dorothy Stickney, uh, Alice Ghostly, Kay Ballard, of course, Judy, uh, Julie Andrews, and Edie Adams. I am wishing, in the name of every young girl who ever wanted to go to a dance and was told that she couldn't, I wish that I may go to that dance tonight. I wish that by some kind of magic or abracadabra or, or fol de roll and fiddly dee that all the kind hearts in the world will put their heads together. All the kind hearts put their heads together. You know what I mean? That all the kind hearts and good souls will wish with me and that you, Godmother, will help me with every ounce of strength and cleverness you possess. Cinderella. Yeah. It's impossible. Impossible. I suppose so. Impossible. 
For a plain yellow pumpkin to become a golden carriage, impossible. For a plain country bumpkin and a prince to join in marriage, and four white mice will never be four white horses. Such folder all and fiddle dee dee, of course, is impossible. But the world is full of zanies and fools who don't believe in sensible rules and won't believe what sensible people say. And because these daft and dewy eyed dopes keep building up impossible hopes, impossible things are happening every Impossible, 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 impossible things are happening every day. Is that true, Godmother? Well, yes, I suppose so, in a way. Then I continue to build up my impossible hope for tonight. And I officially wish... Officially? I officially wish and wish and wish all those things I said about the pumpkin and the mice and the rats. Impossible. Just the same I'm wishing it. Impossible. For a plain yellow pumpkin to become a golden carriage. Impossible. For a plain country bumpkin and a prince to join in marriage. And four white mice will never be four white horses. They will. Such folder on and fiddle dee of course, is impossible. But the world is full of zanies and fools who don't believe in sensible rules and won't believe what sensible people say. And because these daft and dewy-eyed dopes keep building up impossible hopes, impossible things are happening every day. Look at yourself. Oh, how beautiful. Come on now, the ball will be over before you get there. in marriage and four white mice are easily turned to horses such faldy roll and fiddly dee of course is quite possible it's possible for the world is full of zanies and fools who don't believe in sensible rules and won't believe what sensible people say and because these daft and dewy-eyed dopes keep building up impossible hopes impossible Things are happening every day. It's possible. 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 Well, I am wishing. The next scene is Kay Ballard and Alice Ghostly, the Wicked Stepsisters. This is just wonderful theater. Why would a fellow want a girl like her, a frail and fluffy beauty? Why can't a fella ever once prefer a solid girl? Like me, a frothy little bubble with a flimsy kind of charm, and with very little trouble, I could break her little arm. <laughs> oh, oh, why would a fellow want a girl like her? So obviously unusual. Why can't a fella ever once prefer a usual girl like me? Her cheeks are a pretty shade of pink, but not any pinker than a rose is. Skin may be delicate and soft, but not any softer than a dose is. Her neck is no wider than a swan. She's only a sapient baby. She's only as graceful as a bird. So why is a fella going crazy? Oh, why would a fella want a girl like her? A girl who's merely lovely. Why can't a fella ever once 
moment from uh, Cinderella and strange this is the ball something has just happened to you and you don't know what it is yes that's exactly the way I see it have you no idea what it may be no I have no idea I wonder how we can find out let us think back over our history together it isn't very long Minutes ago I saw you I looked up when you came through the door My head started reeling You gave me the feeling The room had no ceiling or floor Ten minutes ago I met you And we murmured our oh, how do you do I wanted to ring out the bells And fling out my arms And to sing out the news I have found Oh, she's an angel with the dust of the stars in her eyes. We are dancing, we are flying, and she's taking me back to the skies. In the arms of my love, I'm flying over mountain and meadow and glen. And I like it so well that for all I can tell, I may never come down again. I may never come down to earth again. Oh, everybody seems to be looking up at us here in the box. Come with me. I have told you how I felt. You haven't described your feeling. Well, uh, they're very much the same as yours. Ten minutes ago I met you and we murmured our oh, I wanted to ring out the bells and fling out my arms and to sing out the news. I have found her, she's an angel, with the dust of the stars in her eyes. We are dancing, we are flying, and she's taking me back to the stars. In the arms of my love I'm flying over mountain and meadow and glen, and I like it so well that for all And again, uh, Cinderella captured, was the largest viewed show in the 1950s other than the birth of Little Ricky. Well, they go back to Broadway and they buy the, the rights to the book, The Flower Drum Song, the story of Asian immigration uh, in San Francisco and one particular family. The odd thing about it, first of all, they hired Gene Kelly uh, to direct it, which was a mistake. Uh, he made it into like a vaudeville treatment of the Asian characters. And uh, the score was phenomenal, but the script was just not true uh, to the tale at all. Uh, it was a limited success. It ran for a year and a half, and it was the help of the Broadway musical
And again, this was Rodgers and Hammerstein trying to be modern, but the song that is one of the best, uh, it's a great character song. And of course, when it was written, it had one sort of a sensibility. And today, many people look at it and they cringe, uh, but it's a wonderful, wonderful character song from the Flower Drum Song. And this is from the BBC Proms. <laughs> I'm a girl, and by me that's only great. I am proud that my silhouette is curvy, that I walk with a sweet and girlish gait, with my hips kind of swivelly and swervy. I adore being dressed in something frilly. When my date comes to get me at my place, out I go with my Joe or John or Billy, like a family who is ready for the race. When I have a brand new hairdo, with my eyelashes all in curve, I float as the clouds on hairdo. I enjoy being a girl. The men say I'm cute and fun. One of the great moments, again, from Flower Drum Song. Uh, the Sound of Music came next. Mary Martin had not been uh, on the Broadway stage since six years earlier with Peter Pan, and she was really looking uh, for a vehicle. And uh, one thought that surfaced was to take the uh, Arthur Lawrence play, Time of the Cuckoo, about a, an old maid school teacher who goes to Florence 
and has an awakening. It had been filmed in the movie Summertime. And Richard Halliday, Mary Martin's husband, said that the idea of America's sweetheart playing an old maid uh, just really didn't appeal to them. Well, then they discovered and they found uh, the, the memoir of Maria von Trapp. And they thought, now there's a story. And they go to Lindsay and Krauss to write it. And uh, within that, they thought that they were going to do a play with a bunch of Bach madrigals. Uh, but when they thought about it, they realized that that was probably going to need more music. So they go to Richard Rogers, who says, look, you either get Bach or Rogers, but you don't get both. Obviously, then the team wrote the words and lyrics to uh, The Sound of Music. Now, they cast Mary Martin, who was 47 at the time. Uh, she was a little old uh, to be portraying Maria von Trapp, and they cast Theodore Bikel, obviously, to play Captain von Trapp because he was a folk singer. But it didn't play out the way they all had thought uh, in terms of what they thought they would accomplish uh, by doing this together. But The Sound of Music has become truly one of the most famous of all of the Rodgers and Hammerstein uh, uh, opus, and uh, it's an unbelievable piece. The music is sung by everybody. This is Florence Henderson from a 1968. Uh, a drop of golden sun. an aside, in the 1980s, Florence Henderson developed a tremendous uh, fear of performing, uh, and uh, she, it took her many years to overcome that, just incidentally. Here's another odd uh, moment, uh, Sound of Music. That's Mama Cass. Johnny Mathis. These are a few of our favorite things. Cream-colored ponies and crisp 
John Davidson. While he slept by with the moon on their wings, these are a few of my favorite things. Girls in white dresses with blue satin sashes, snowflakes that stay on my nose and eyelashes, silver white winters that melt in spring, these are a few of my Has that been an odd grouping? Odd assortment of people, but the Rodgers and Hammerstein music is what it is. And, you know, the sound of music is just really uh, something that we all know, we all love, and we all cherish. Well, the last song that Rodgers and Hammerstein wrote was written because Theodore Bickell was extremely upset uh, by the fact that he had very little to do. So they wrote a song uh, really to, to that would move the plot in a very specific way but would also be very pertinent uh, for the skills of uh, Theodore Bickell. And this is the last song that Rodgers and Hammerstein ever wrote. Well, it should be. Hold on one moment. Tech issue again. Hold on. Getting the tech issue fixed, I hope quickly. Mm -hmm. Here we go. We'll get this started again in a moment. Hold on. Here we go.
small and white, clean and bright. You look happy to meet me. Blossom of snow, may you bloom and grow, bloom and grow forever. Edelweiss, Edelweiss, bless my homeland forever. Blossom of snow, may you And with that beautiful view of the Alps and Julie Andrews, uh, you know, the movie changed a great deal of the Sound of Music play, but in the Sound of Music, the play, it's the characters that had the political, the second couple had the political songs, but the movie is magnificent on its own and the play uh, is certainly a, a masterpiece as well. Well, I hope that everyone enjoyed uh, our visit with Rogers and Hammerstein this morning. And uh, I thank you all for coming every Friday as usual. See you all soon. Bye-bye.